Uh, tonight, Sandy Weber, she's going to share with us some of what she knows about bluebirds and how to set up and monitor a bluebird house trail. She's been a master naturalist since uh, 2016, been in the, uh, and currently she's our, our volunteer projects committee chair. Uh, she's a former uh, pediatric and obstetric, okay, obstetric nurse and has lived in the New River Valley for 20 years. Uh, she, once she had some good luck back in uh, 20, what'd you say, Sandy, 16, you had, you had good luck with bluebirds nesting in your yard and that kind of inspired her to go ahead, or 2015, and go ahead and, and start looking at bluebird trails. So she became involved with the Virginia Bluebird Society after finding out that their research, their resources were so helpful. Uh, she's helped with the Blacksburg High School Bluebird Trail. Um, and she's also worked with the state uh, turf grass professionals in the to encourage bluebird trails. Um, and so you go ahead, Sandy, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So hang on one second. Okay, can you all see the screen? Yes. Okay, yes. great. Uh, so thank you all for taking the time to tune in. I know you you were aware that I was gonna speak tonight. I think before I get going, I wanna say number one, I know that there are a lot of you out in the audience tonight who have done bluebirding and you notice I use it as a verb. <laughs> um, so I apologize to the grammarians out there. Um, but I want to say more than anything that having a bluebird trail is just a lot of fun. And in fact, my neighbor, um, I asked him if he would be a substitute for me when I first got started with bluebirds, thinking if I was on vacation for a week in the summer, I might need a sub. And he said, yeah, but I need to go out with you once and see what it's all about and what to do. And the first time we both, I said, well, I'm learning from a book, so we'll do it together. And the first time we looked in a box and saw the nest and the eggs, it was just so exciting. So that's why I got going doing more and more trails. So today what I'm going to talk about is why we need bluebird trails, how to create and monitor a trail. I have some great pictures of what happens uh, with mating and nesting and um, egg laying and the whole reproduction process. And I'll let you know a little bit about what bluebird trails are around here and whether they're productive or not and what some of the issues are with the trails. I personally have set up a trail. My first trail after I had my one box in my yard, which I put up as a garden whimsy. There was just a little open mode space between my house and my neighbors and I thought well I'll, I'll put a box there and see what happens. I was shocked that a bluebird showed up. But at the time I was a golfer and I got permission at Virginia Tech to set up a trail there. I put up six boxes and those boxes this year I fledged 42 bluebirds out of the six boxes. Um, and it's been very productive. And now I've gotten um, the, the town to allow me to put a, uh, a, court, uh, a bluebird trail at the hill, which is the municipal golf course. And um, Virginia Tech's also allowed me to put one at the Turf Grass Research Center. So um, that's really been my experience. So I know I'm talking to naturalists, this might be very simplistic, but I, the reason I put this here, I put it up if I'm speaking to people who really don't know much about birds, so they know which bird we're talking about. But if you're talking to somebody about a bluebird trail and they don't know the birds, I think the, the blue jay is the one they might think about because we don't see bluebirds that often, not as often as blue jays. So. Uh, it's Cialis Cialis, is the, is the eastern bluebird. There are also, there's a western bluebird and a mountain bluebird, and out west people do have 
trails for them as well, and they also are threatened. So um, I just wanted to point that out, but of course here we have the Eastern Bluebird. These are, um, the male is on the top and it's a bright blue, stunning, stunningly blue, fantastic bird, and they are in the thrush family. So they are related to robins and the other thrushes. Uh, the female has the same coloring, but much duller. You don't always see the blue unless she spreads her wing feathers. And the juvenile has <coughs> a lot of speckles, and it's thought that those speckles on juvenile birds are protective, that it offers them some camouflage when they leave the nest. So Bluebird Trail is just a bunch of boxes that are set up uh, to promote reproduction of bluebirds and other cavity nesting birds. I want to emphasize that. Uh, tree swallows, house wrens, chickadees, titmice. Uh, Bill uh, Opengari, who's actually the county coordinator for the Virginia Bluebird Society in Giles County, he had a prothonotary warbler start a nest this year in one of his boxes. Um, and it did not, it didn't fledge any any birds. I can't remember if it laid eggs and then something happened to it, but it didn't, it, it didn't have any young. But um, these are all native birds and they're welcome. And of course, with the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, you can't do anything about them being in your, in your houses. Uh, and we're going to talk quite a bit about uh, house sparrows uh, down the line here in a minute. So why do we have bluebird trails? Why are they so popular? Well, the bluebird is really in the, in our popular imagination is a lovely, you know, the bluebird of happiness. There's songs about it. Um, Song of the South, the bluebird is um, just, you know, um, carrying the garlands around and the, the bluebird is, is a happy, we have a happy thought about bluebirds. In colonial times, they were as common as the robin, the American robin. Um, and around the turn of the 20th century, you know, like in the early 1900s, people realized that they were really, they're declining in numbers. Uh, and it's because of habitat loss and introduction of the house sparrow and the starling. Um, so they thought there were a lot of people who were thinking it might become extinct. And then Thomas Musselman of Quincy, Illinois in 1934, he is attributed, he, the first trail is attributed to him in, in 1934. He um, wrote a column every week in a newspaper, in a magazine or a journal, I guess it was called the Nature Society News. And it was, um, called the Bluebird Trail. And he tried to get Bluebird Trails popularized and he did actually do that. Uh, and it, it started uh, catching on around the country in the 60s and 70s, of course in the, in the 60s after Silent Spring, the environmental mm -hmm. movement started, people got even more interested. And then Musselman gave up his column in the um, Nature Society News to Dr. Larry Zelaney, who wrote a book about trying to save bluebirds. And then for some reason, his, his article in the National Geographic Song of Hope for the Bluebirds really touched a lot of nerves and people got started um, wholeheartedly trying to save bluebirds. And, the, and they formed the North American Bluebird Society. I can't speak highly enough about the North American Bluebird Society, NABS, people call it, because if you go to their website, they have just fantastic resources. They have just tons of papers, fact sheets about what to do with every problem that you can imagine, everything you want to know about boxes and how to mount them. And there's just lots of information uh, their dues are very reasonable. They sponsor research. They have a very good uh, journal that comes out, I don't know, maybe quarterly. Um, but I, I highly recommend NABS uh, if you're interested in bluebirds. And they have an emergency line. 
So if you have a Bluebird emergency, if you go to their website, they, I think you can't call them right off the bat. You have to go through a little problem solving thing to make sure that you need to call them. But uh, they do have an emergency line for Bluebird emergencies. And then after NABS was formed, the state societies kind of came on board and we have the Virginia Bluebird Society here in Virginia. Currently, there are about 22 million Eastern Bluebirds. I think that might be a 2017 number. Um, but if you look at this bottom bullet point, there were 4,700 nests reported to uh, Virginia Bluebird Society. Um, that might be double. There are at least 2,500 nest boxes that people are monitoring and supporting in Virginia. And I'm sure there are lots more than that. People don't always report to the Bluebird Society. So interestingly, Bluebirds take very readily to boxes. Uh, I gifted four Bluebird boxes to a friend's property. He lives in Southeast Ohio and we visit him often in this 180 acres of just pristine wilderness. And as a thank you gift, I, my husband and I went and installed four Bluebird boxes. And before we had the fourth one installed, Bluebirds were checking out the first one. They really <laughs> readily take to boxes. Um, but their, their beaks are not strong enough to make their own cavities. They're called secondary cavity nesters. Uh, here are the primary cavity nesters, not only redheaded woodpeckers, but woodpeckers. They can make the cavities, but bluebirds have to find already made cavities. They might be naturally formed, not necessarily by a woodpecker, but they're just not enough cavities anymore. That's the problem. So land has been cleared. You know, we have habitat loss. It just cleared for housing and development and highways and agriculture. Agriculture, I feel, you know, it used to be that you had a farmstead and that farmstead had a little woodlot on it and a windbreak and hedgerows between the fields and, um, and fences that were made, the fence posts were made out of wood. But now with this mega, with the mega farms, there are no hedgerows and people don't even live on the farms anymore. You know, they're aggregated. Um, so a lot of those trees in the plains and agricultural areas are taken down. And then if you look in the suburbs, for example, at Virginia Tech, they, you know, they worry about trees coming down on pedestrians or, you know, people who are walking along. So any suburban landscape, people take their trees down either for because of appearance or because of liability. And then f fence posts have been replaced with metal posts and all of these factors have deprived bluebirds and other cavity nesters of places to nest. And then we get to the house sparrow. <laughs> Do you remember how many bluebirds I said there probably are right now? Uh, 22 million. Well, there's 70 million house sparrows estimated in the United States. The house sparrow came in like 1850s for pest control. And you notice the name house sparrow. They like to stay around habitations and, um, and farms where there's grain spilled and animal feed. They will congregate there. And they are very aggressive. They like the same kind of nesting spots as bluebirds, and they don't want any bluebirds in their area at all. You could give them a nest and a box and the bluebird a nest box, and they still might go and attack the bluebirds because they just want the space for themselves. Um, I think I have some more information about what to do about that here in a minute. Now the starling, the starling came to the United States because Eugene Schieflin decided that all the birds mentioned in Shakespeare should be here in, the, in North America. So he introduced the starling. There might be 200 million starlings now. Now starlings can't get into a nest box that has a one and a half inch um, hole restrictor or one and a half inch size hole. But 
lots of cavities in trees don't have a one and a half inch hole, they're just a big hole. And uh, so starlings really are aggressive about taking nesting sites in, in cavities. Then the other problem, of course, is pesticides, particularly, and herbicides as well. Bluebirds are insectivores. They feed their young almost exclusively with insects. In the, sun, in the winter, they will eat berries, and you can plant on your property for bluebirds. Uh, most of the berries that are good for all the other birds are good for bluebirds. Um, in fact, some people look at the droppings that they see around their, blue, their nest boxes. If the bluebirds are feeding earthworms or ber berries to their young, it means that they're in trouble because they really want to see, they really want to feed um, insects and cat, you know, caterpillars and other juicy insects. They don't want to feed their young um, berries, but um, so they're insectivores and pesticides interrupt the food chain by poisoning the insects. Oddly, the, the golf courses, which you know are known to use a lot of chemicals, seem to be quite productive for bluebirds. So um, that's a little bit of a conundrum, but the, the Virginia Tech golf course is my most productive, is the most productive bluebird trail in Blacksburg, I would guess. I don't know all of them, but I, I, I'm guessing it is. So if you want to start a bluebird trail, what do you need to look for? Um, open land with scattered bushes, trees, low or sparse ground cover. And it likes mowed areas. Now the, blue, the Blacksburg High School um, bluebird trail is not particularly productive and it's because it doesn't get mowed. It gets, ve it gets very tall in the summer the bluebirds like to sit on a branch and drop to the ground to, to mow lawn or ground of some sort and get insects. The very tall uh, grassy areas are, you know, areas with natives that are tall that they, they don't like as well. Uh, pasture land, golf courses, cemeteries, and parks are particularly good. So um, if you have an area like that, that would be gr a great thing, but I will remind you, avoid areas where house sparrows are abundant. So before you set up a bluebird trail, you need to think about what you'll do when a house sparrow attacks your bluebirds or takes over your bluebird boxes. Now, I have a lot of suggestions for you, but one of them includes capturing and killing the, the house sparrows. So you need to think about it before you get started. I have not had to do it. I mean, I really am not a very good advisor about this particular problem because none of the, the three trails that I personally monitor or the high school that I've been helping with, we haven't had house sparrows. But I know Jean and Sharon, they've had house sparrows. They've had good luck with spookers. And there are a lot of suggestions. Uh, the most recent one that I've heard, it, unfortunately, if you remove the house sparrow nest, they can go marauding all around your bluebird trail and just be very vengeful. Um, I, if, I, I hate to be an anthropomorphic, but uh, they can be vengeful. <laughs> uh, but one, one person I was reading about, they take the eggs and they microwave them or heat them and then put them back. So the blue, the house sparrow thinks it's sitting on the nest, um, but it's not going to be productive. So there, some people are using stones that look like eggs, replacing the eggs with, with fake eggs. Um, but, the, the, and there are a bunch of different uh, kinds of traps that you can put in the, in the box. But house sparrows, if you set up a, tra a trail near house sparrows, be prepared to deal with that. So suitable boxes, there are a lot of different boxes and I'll just say that almost everything I'm gonna say today 
you can find an exception to. There are a lot of different boxes. I have been using a box called the Carl Little box. And Carl Little is actually a Virginian. And the boxes I have purchased all from a man who is not making them this year because of COVID. Um, but there are, there's a Peterson box, which is kind of a tilted looking gizmo. There are people who've made boxes out of PVC pipe. There are a lot of different kinds of boxes that have been effective. Uh, but it should, you should know whether it's a good box. Read a little bit about it before you get a particular box. Um, I just mentioned PVC, but here the, uh, a lot of people recommend that it's wood. It should be easy to open, monitor, and clean. Now my box is open on the side and they're hinged at the bottom. The ones at the high school are hinged at the top and it's very hard to look into some of those boxes. The hole needs to be one and a half inches uh, and there are hole protectors and hole restrictors. Sometimes after a few years, either a woodpecker will try to enlarge it or it gets rough from weather. Uh, it should be smooth um, when, it, when necessary. Uh, if a woodpecker has enlarged it, I have little brass restrictors that I can put on um, to keep it from getting enlarged anymore. Should be mounted on a, something smooth, not on a fence line or trees, because on trees, like a cat or a raccoon can climb up or a snake. They should have predator guards, and I'm going to show you some in a minute. They should be about five feet off the ground to make them easier to monitor, but there are all sorts of permutations of that. Um, I'm going to recommend a book to you at the end of the talk. And they have pictures of people checking their boxes on horseback and people who have them winched up on pulleys. And there are all sorts of ways that you can adjust that. But if you just want to do something simple, make it so you can look in. I have to use a little mirror to look into my boxes. Um, and then face it away from the prevailing winds and not too far from a tree or shrub. So this, every time I cite a box, uh, I have been told that the tree should be somewhere where the young can see it and fly to it when they make their fledgling flight. Uh, so sometimes it means I'm not ever gonna necessarily face it east away from the western winds or so each, each place is a little bit different and I have to make a decision of what's more important. Um, the, um, you know, you, you don't want it right under a tree where something like a snake could drop down onto it or a, a, another, you know, a raccoon could drop down onto it. So sighting it is kind of important. This is a typical box that I've been using. This stovepipe baffle keeps raccoons and cats. Cats can maybe jump over the stovepipe, but then you've got the Noel guard, which is the uh, the wood, the um, hardware cloth little um, entrance way. And when I first made those Noel guards, I smoothed them, but now I've been told you leave the the wires Oh, you leave the wires out so it makes it harder for raccoons to reach in. Bluebird boxes don't need a perch. The thick, a good thick roof protects it from sun and uh, the overhang protects it from rain. The floor space, it says four by four. Some of them, different people do different things. Some people have put some wire like a little wire floor in to let blowfly larva drop down. Some people have curved the edges, like kind of curved the edges so the larva can, blowfly larva can drop down. I, I know that CRC puts in little plastic bases inside, like from a Clorox bottle, but I, I'm actually not sure why. I maybe make it easier to clean. Is that why, Barb? It's, well, milk jugs, they're quart-sized milk yeah. jugs so that you can clean them out easily. Easier to clean, okay. Yeah. So this is why predator guards are important. 
Uh, I don't think I have to say more about it. Although I will just remind you when you open the box to check, I always stand aside mostly because sometimes a bird will fly out where I've opened it, but there could also be a snake lurking in here. <laughs> Particularly if you don't have the, the stove pipe, pipe, pipe baffle. So here's my husband mounting some boxes for me, uh, for our friends in Ohio. So spacing the boxes is debatable, but if you put them too close, bluebirds won't use them. So either 300 feet apart or more, but then you can pair boxes. You can put them five, 10 or 15 feet apart and potentially have a bluebird and a tree swallow nest next to each other. The tree sw two tree swallows won't nest 10 feet apart or 15 feet apart, but a bluebird and a tree swallow might nest next to each other like that. Uh, I just read something recently about actually putting two boxes on one pole uh, facing the opposite way in, in, as a way to pair boxes. Um, I like to get my boxes ready. I like to do it in the fall so I don't have to worry about it in the spring. But what I do in the fall is I go by and make sure any repairs get done. I make sure they're cleaned, although they should be already cleaned. And I put some clean straw in the bottom. And I fill in any ventilation hole, air, ventilation areas with foam. And then on the coldest nights, bluebirds and other birds can go in there and roost in the middle of winter. And then I go around in the spring before bluebirds start nesting and clean out that straw. Sometimes I leave the, um, the insulation in if it's still cold uh, and, and check the boxes one more time to make sure they're ready. But our bluebirds here, you know, bluebirds, some of them migrate. We have bluebirds here all winter. Whether they're the same bluebirds that are gonna nest here, I can't tell you 100% if that's true. But I see early in March, bluebirds checking out the boxes. So a lot of lay people, lay people being not naturalists, think that monitoring, uh, you know, looking at a box or touching a bird's nest or touching an egg will discourage the parents and, and make keep them away. But bluebirds really are very tolerant. In fact, I know a lot of, I've heard of a lot of monitors who will pick up the, the female. A lot of times the female won't leave the nest when you look in and they'll pick up the female and look at the eggs underneath to see it count them or to show the female to children or other people that they're trying to show the process to. I don't handle the birds if, if I can avoid it. I, that's not something I've been trained to do or feel comfortable doing. But um, bluebirds really, you can monitor them. You can monitor them almost every day. But when it says careful monitoring, I, I, there are some basic ideas that you should adhere to. And one is if it's raining, I would avoid it because the bluebirds are, they're already having trouble getting their insects and it just makes life harder for them if you interrupt them while they're on a rainy day. You shouldn't check them early in the morning. That's when they're laying eggs and that can interrupt their egg laying. Uh, so I would be, you know, just try to do it on a nice, day in, you know, in the later in the day. Uh, but bluebird proponents also say you shouldn't put boxes up unless you are going to monitor them. Because if you put that box there and don't take care of any of the problems that they're having, you're just letting them put all this energy into reproduction. And then if it fails, um, you've got nothing. So um, we really recommend that you monitor. I monitor, I, you know, the rule of thumb is to monitor once a week. On my own trails, I try to go five days. I, I do five or six days. I, I, keep, I can keep a, a better eye on things. And then we'd lo love for you to report your data. If you 
are having a trail here in Blacksburg or the New River Valley uh, in Montgomery County. If you report your data to me or let me know, I can tell you how to report your data uh, on what kind of forms. And you can report to Nest Watch or to um, which is Cornell or to the Virginia Bluebird Society. I believe there's been a lot of talk. It hasn't happened yet, but I believe that the Virginia Bluebird Society or is going to combine with Nest Watch so there is one reporting place. That has not happened yet. We'll see what happens. So some of the things that you can intervene with, um, well, number one, I, I already mentioned the house sparrows. Snakes and raccoons, you can, usually it's too late, but once you see that you have snakes and raccoons, maybe then you could get stovepipe baffles and Noel guards and, and start over. Birds will, um, will try another nest if their first one fails. Paper wasps uh, can discourage birds. I, one way to fix that is to rub a bar of soap on the inside of your box. We've had a little bit of um, success with diatomaceous earth for ants, but I was just reading about Tanglefoot and Vaseline. Tanglefoot is a product you can buy and Vaseline you can put on your poles to discourage ants. So maybe we'll try that next year because we've had a lot of ant problems at Virginia, at the um, Blacksburg High School. Diatomaceous earth is not a, a chemical. It's ground up foraminifera, I believe, and diatomes. And you can lift the nest and squirt. I use like a ketchup squirt bottle and I squirt a little diatomaceous earth under the nest if I see a lot of ants or um, other insects. So here's what happens. Here's how bluebirds pair and nest. So it, in this area, of course, each tier of states, the northern tier, the dates are different, and the southern tier, the dates are different. Here in Virginia, in southwest Virginia, the bluebirds start the males come first and start singing from a perch to attract a female when she arrives. And they, he shows her different properties <laughs> and she picks one. And once they, once, usually in mid to late March, the female makes her final nest site selection and then she starts building the nest. The nest is going to be grass or pine needles, almost 100%, and they're pretty tidy. She'll form the, the cup, and then she forms a cup with her breast. Um, and if you do bluebird monitoring, you'll eventually be able to tell a, most of the time a bluebird nest from a tree swallow nest, from a chickadee nest. This, by the way, this picture, you can see there's a little hole restrictor on it or a, a hole protector on that box. So um, he will look in and if you see two, a male and a female go in the box and you can be pretty sure they're probably going to start nesting there. The um, female will lay one egg each day. Now I mentioned she'll build the nest. Like this spring, this past spring, a lot of my bluebirds built nests and then didn't lay eggs for a while. And it was because we had some very cold, damp weather. So they will build a nest and they may start laying eggs right away, but they may wait. I, I mean, there are a lot of different, the, the birds seem to know a lot of what they should do. Usually around here, most of my first clutch of the season is five eggs. I have had six eggs. They're usually blue, but um, they can be white. I, I think we had white ones over at the high school, and I have a, a pair that's been laying white eggs for two years over at the Turf Grass Center. So they lay one egg each morning, but they don't start incubating them until they're all laid, and then she begins to incubate the eggs. She takes feathers out of her breast to make a brood patch so her skin is against the eggs and it's warmer. She'll only leave the nest for a short period of time um, for about two weeks. 
So they, she starts incubating them all together and then they, flit, they hatch all together. They generally hatch within a few hours of each other. And then she st the female does still stay on the nest with the very young chicks for about eight days. And this is day one. They really can't even hold their heads up, they, hardly at all. And it can just look like, now these are tree swallows, by the way, and you can see the feathered nest. This is day one of tree swallows, and they do look a little different than the bluebirds. Here, go back to the bluebirds. They have like darker fluff, and the, the um, tree swallows are more naked. This is day five of bluebirds, and they can just look like a big ball of worms. So if you look at the gape is the yellow part of their mouth that they, it gives a target area for the parents for dropping food in. Sometimes if you make a little clicking sound, it will kind of wake them up. They'll think it's the mother or the father, and they'll all open their gapes and look up for the food, and that makes it easier to count. Here's an example of that. That's day seven, day 11. Now their feathers are, the feather sheaths, the feathers come, first a sheath comes out and then the feather comes out of the sheath there. The day 11, the feathers are mostly out of the sheaths. They have very short tails yet. The parents will feed up to five times an hour from dawn till dusk. They take these fecal sacs away from the nest and the bluebird nests are quite clean. Tree swallow nests are not clean. They're just full of guano and really terrible to clean. Here's a male bringing some, a caterpillar to the box. So the chicks fledge when they're 16 to 20 days old and most sources will tell you that one of the reasons it's important to monitor or one to monitor routinely is to know when to expect the birds to hatch, when to expect them to fledge. Because after day 12, most places recommend that you don't open the box because the birds can jump out prematurely. This happened to me one time only. It was a mistake. I was partnering with someone and they didn't read the, the, the data sheet right. We opened the box and the birds all jumped out. We tried to stuff them back in and they kept jumping out. Uh, and you really don't want that to happen. Um, but other people, you know, as I said, there's an exception to everything. I've read some people who say they put one hand over, their, over the hole. They must not have a Noel guard. And then they look in because they feel that there can be problems in the last five days and those birds are salvageable if there's a problem. So um, there's an exception to every rule, but just be aware that birds can jump out pretty quickly and, and they, they won't fly. They'll just land on the ground and then they're open to predation. So um, there is the Federal Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which says that you can't interfere or possess nests or eggs or interfere with bird nesting. Uh, so I'm gonna show you some pictures of some other birds. Uh, the Bluebird Society gets a permission from the state for their county coordinators to have nests uh, and to, to, for demonstration purposes. Nobody's gonna, I, I, don't, I actually think it's a good idea to have a spare nest. If you have a really wet nest or something happens, you can transfer the chicks to a clean, dry nest. Um, and there's, you can read about how people do that. But um, just beware that there are laws about this. Now, the book that I'm gonna recommend to you, it does, when I was reading it, they say, the dummy nests that house wrens build, that you can remove them because they're dummy nests. I, I don't know if that, I'm not a lawyer, so <laughs> don't take my legal advice. So here are tree swallows, and they have very 
um, easily identifiable nests because they feather their nests. And I don't know where they get all these feathers, but sometimes they're just so spectacular and they cover the eggs when they leave the nest. Um, they're fantastic flyers. They also are insectivores um, and they have white eggs. Here is the house wren. I highly recommend that you don't put your boxes close to shrubby areas. Uh, I made that mistake at the turf grass center the first year. I wanted to stay out of the turf grass center operations, so I cited my boxes out, like on the periphery of the area, and it kind of borders on the Huckleberry Trail and the the um, German Club and some other wooded areas. And we have a lot, we, it's a house wren trail there sometimes. And house wrens will destroy other birds' nests. They'll evict, um, they evicted some chickadees of mine this year. So I, they're cute and they have a beautiful song and, and they're native cavity nesters, but I would try to um, plan to avoid them if you can. They're tiny, they have, they lay a lot of eggs. They usually have seven or eight eggs and they're tiny. Chickadees and titmice build the most beautiful nests. They fill about three inches of the box with bits and bits and bits, like thousands of bits of moss. Then they make a cup and line it with, I don't know, dog fur and dandelion fluff. And it just, they're just beautiful little nests. So um, I just want to take a minute to talk about what you as a master naturalist can do uh, related to bluebirds. Uh, you can work through the chapter because we, our chapter has been handling the Black, Blacksburg High School Trail. Uh, this is the first year we did it from the beginning of the season to the end of the season because the students weren't involved. You could set up your own trail on public land like I've done at the Virginia Tech golf course or the municipal golf course. You can find an existing trail and monitor or help maintain it. Now, I think Rosemary, I emailed you and did get an answer, but I think Rosemary, oh, I said Warm Hearth. Yeah, Warm Hearth. Um, she's been doing that at Warm Hearth, I believe. You can use your own property and submit the data. And the McCords, Judy and Mac McCord submit um, they call their trail the mud, the mud pike trail. I think it's their own property. I don't know that 100%, but they have 11 boxes and they submit their data. Or you can look into other organizations. Um, the CRC, uh, the, the, the Bird Club has a trail at the CRC. Um, the, I'm, what I wanna say about your volunteer hours and using this for volunteer hours is, uh, I talked with Michelle Presby about, Prisby about it because we really didn't know about if you put it on your own property, how you would count it. And this is her advice and this is what our project committee is going to go with. If you set up property on public land, if you set up a trail on public land, setting up the trail and monitoring it and of course, recording your data and all the time it takes to do that would all be volunteer hours. If you're setting the boxes up on your own property, you can still use volunteer hours for monitoring and data, data recording and data manipulation, but not for setting up the trails. That's considered kind of in, uh, enriching your own property. So that's, uh, that was Michelle's recommendation and that's how we're going to go with it. So um, these, are, these are my recommendations if you want to get started. Number one, you can call me. I didn't put me up there, but you could call me. Um, the North American Bluebird Society, NABS, I mentioned them earlier. The Virginia Bluebird Society, both of these organizations have just tons of information on their websites. And I use their, the Virginia Bluebird Society, I use their reporting forms um, and they, they're, they have minimal fee to join, but you can use their information even if you don't join, but I do recommend that you support them. Nestwatch, which is a project of Cornell, and they have a really great book about, or booklet about how to monitor bird nests. And they ask 
nest watch is not just for bluebirds. It's for any wild bird that you want to monitor a nest. And this is how I got started with the Bluebird Monitor's Guide. It's a book, it's a paperback book that's available on Amazon. And it's just a wealth of information. It has the history, it has all the different, it has lots of personal experiences of different, um, different bluebirders. So that is my talk. I didn't mention anything about asking questions, but um, if it, the question, anyone... I think you answered just about everything. Most are comments, except about the mealworm. And oh. I even that uh, people are, you know, you almost have to train your birds to like to eat your dried mealworms. Well, you know, the first, the way I got started with bluebirds was that when I saw a bluebird looking at the box in my yard, I wrote to, maybe it was on a listserv or a blog from the Bluebird Society. I said, I see some bluebirds looking at my box. I'm so excited. Oh, I, I didn't ask for advice. I just put it out there that I was, I couldn't believe that right in the center of Blacksburg, a bluebird was looking at my box. And Barbara Chambers, who is, I think, revered among bluebirders in Virginia, because she's one of the start, she started the Virginia Bluebird Society. She wrote to me, she took the time to write to me and said, if you get live mealworms and put them out, your bluebirds will stay. And they did. I, I bought live mealworms online. You can actually get them at PetSmart, but you can buy them by the bag online. It's, and um, bluebirds really like live mealworms. They will eat the dried mealworms, but the live mealworms are really much more nutritious for them. And some bluebirds, if the weather is bad in the spring, or if one of the partners, like if the male or the female gets killed and you know that you only have one partner trying to feed the nest, people will put out mealworms to help them along. So live mealworms really are the ideal for bluebirds. There, yeah, there are lots of ways to raise live wheel, mealworms. Yes, yes, people oh, do it in their apples, I don't know, in a shoebox. There are lots of plans out there to look up. It's just kind of smelly and inconvenient. So, um, uh, so that on the chat, did anyone look at the, I can take a quick look at the. I've been keeping track of it. I think you covered everything. Okay. Oh, okay. Great. Great. Uh, anything else before I turn it over to myself? <laughs> Hello, this is Rose Marie. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, I want to mention that someone offered um, red cedar wood to me for bluebird houses or any type of uh, birdhouse for that matter. And so I'm throwing it out to everyone. If, if anyone knows of anyone or is interested in this wood to let me know and I can tell David Pierce. Okay, great. Hey, Sandy, this is Ann Reardon. I how many boxes do you have to have in order to submit data? Maybe. Oh, you could sub you could give me one box and I'll submit the data. Okay. So I compile as the as the county coordinator, I compile the data. So really, I'm only getting data from about six trails right now, but I'd love to get more data. the The data that that I need is uh, I can send you the form. But the, when I send it into the Virginia Bluebird Society, um, I, I put on the form um, how many uh, of each species, how many nests, eggs, how many hatched, what kind of predation, and then what the boxes look like. Do they have predator guards? Are they rectangular? Are they on poles? So it's a two page form. It doesn't, it's not too bad to fill out if you've kept the data. Um, or if you just have one box and you want to just tell me what happened in that box and where it was and what it looked like, that would be great. As an example, I just want to tell you that the Virginia Tech Golf Course Trail, which has six boxes, um, it fledged 42 bluebirds this year. And it had all bluebirds. It didn't have any other 
birds in it. And it had seven birds per fledged per box. And they were all bluebirds. Um, some of the other trails um, had like the other, some of the less productive trails had about three to four birds fledged per box. They weren't all bluebirds. Some were tree swallows or house wrens. So you really have to pick your territory to get good bluebird results. Of course, the tree swallows need a place to live too. They actually are on decline as well. So, um, okay, any more about bluebirds before I, I have one more thing to talk about for project committee, so. Sandy, this yes. is Kara. I just I, wanted to ask you, as far as the plans or are there plans to reconfigure the the trail at the high school? Yeah, I really want to. That was my plan. I was hoping maybe we could get to it in October and I would set a, a Saturday date where we could go out and do a work day. Um, I, I really think, again, I think we have to whittle it down. We have to get the boxes out of these, out of that tall growth. Yeah. Um, but I'm not really sure. There's a lot of territory on the school in that whole school complex, but we need to talk to somebody about where we can move, if we can move them. Okay. So um, if somebody wants to work on that with me, or you know, we could walk the trail together, walk that school property together, because I think there are other good places, but it's kind of foolish for us to spend a lot of time and get poor results. So I think we need to, we reconfigured it this year, we got better results. Um, the, the, the Blacksburg High School this year fledged 19 bluebirds. So that is better than we've done in past years. But I think we could do better by citing the boxes better. Well, if you are looking for anybody to help, I'm, I'd like to volunteer. Okay, great. Thanks, Carol. You've been a big help with 